Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about the French Revolution. Uh, it's going to be a long and complex story that takes us from the beginning of the revolution to the beginning of the rise of Napoleon, and I'll do my best to keep it snappy and simple. Here are the goals for your video. These should help guide you through the complex story that I'm about to tell you. All right, so the roots of the French Revolution go back to um, a financial crisis that proved to be difficult to resolve because of lasting inequalities in French society. Uh, so French society was divided into three estates. The first estate was the clergy, the second estate was the aristocracy, and the third estate was the commoners. Um, the first estate controlled only 0.5% of the population, and yet it controlled 10% of all of France's land. The second estate, the aristocracy, was 2% of the population, and it controlled 25% of France's land. In comparison, the third estate, which consisted of commoners, both wealthy uh, commoners and poor working or farming commoners, consisted of 98% of the population, but controlled only 65% of the land. And yet, these guys paid 100% of the taxes. Um, and so basically the tax burden placed on these guys was pretty high because they were the only part of French society actually paying for the government. Uh, by the 1780s, France was deeply, deeply in debt, and it basically had to do something to bring in more money. It's interesting to note that part of the reason that France was so deeply in debt is that it decided to fight a war to help the British colonies in North America to break away from the British. So anyway, they need to increase taxes, but they really can't increase taxes on the commoners anymore because they're already taxing them very heavily. So Louis the 16th decides that he's going to try to tax the nobles, but the nobles object and they demand a meeting of the estates general, uh, which is basically a representative body that hasn't met for more than a hundred years at this point. But Louis the 16th gives in and he decides he's going to allow the estates general to meet and discuss different ways in which the French government might be able to raise the money that it needs to pay its debts. When Louis XVI decides to assemble the estates general, uh, representatives from each estate are elected and they assemble in order to come up with a way to pay off France's debt. There are approximately 600 representatives from the first and second estates, and these guys want to keep as many of the privileges as they can. And there are also a, a roughly equal number of representatives from the third estates. And these guys want to set up a constitutional government and the shift some of the taxes onto the nobles and the clergy. Um, and so it seemed like at first that this was going to work out, but there are a couple uh, kind of sneaky rules that, go, that are in effect at the estates general that seem like they're going to prevent the third estate, that is the commoners, from getting a fair hearing. And so when the commoners realize this, they all storm out of the um, estate's general building, and they march over to a nearby tennis court, which is just one of the only other uh, buildings that could hold all of them. And they get together and they all swear that they're not going to leave the tennis court until they have composed a new constitution for France. Now, with this move, the third estate basically claims power as the true representatives of the people of France, and they give themselves a new name, declaring themselves the National Assembly. So basically, the commoners have uh, risen up and tried to claim power for themselves. Uh, but so, of course, the king is not really happy with this whole idea. And um, it seems that Louis the Sixteenth is preparing to try to end the French Revolution at the very beginning by storming the tennis court and arresting the National Assembly. And for this purpose, it is believed the king began to assemble troops around Paris. But in reaction to this gathering army, the common people of Paris um, started to grow nervous, and in response, they attacked the Bastille, which was a huge. Uh, fortress in the middle of the city that contained a lot of the weapons of the army in that area and also had served as a prison before the revolution. And so the mob successfully takes the castle and the king, after the storming of the Bastille, basically gives up hope of crushing the rebellion 
he doesn't want to risk having to fight against the population of Paris in general. And so instead, he um, basically backs down and allows the National Assembly to continue to function. Soon after this, uh, a mob of hungry women from Paris, there's, they're hungry because there's not enough food going into the city, march out to Versailles. And they break into the palace and force the king to return with them to Paris and to more or less acknowledge the National Assembly as the new um, government of France. So the commoners, in a sort of a spontaneous way, help to support the French Revolution, uh, basically by throwing their weight behind the National Assembly. So with the National Assembly more or less secure because of the storming of the Bastille and the storming of Versailles, uh, they are able to pass a number of reforms from 1789 to 1791. And this is kind of the first phase of the French Revolution, and it's the least extreme phase of the French Revolution. Um, and so the uh, basic ideals of the revolution were summed up in three words, liberty, equality, and fraternity aka brotherhood. And so on the basis of these three ideals, they start to reform French society. They take France from being an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy, in which the king remains in power, but is now checked by a constitution and by an elected rep body of representatives. They um, compose the Declaration of Rights of Man, which enumerates certain inalienable rights that belong to all French uh, men and citizens. Uh, the end of feudalism is something that occurs early on in the revolution when French nobles renounce all of their special privileges and accept the Enlightenment principle that all men are equal before the law. And finally, there's this really strange cultural phenomenon in which they start to get rid of all sorts of traditional aspects of European society and to quote-unquote rationalize them. For example, weeks go from being seven days to ten days because it's believed that ten is a more rational number than seven. The names of the months are also changed to describe the weather of the season. For example, uh, August and um, September are now known as Fructidor because that is the month in which fruits ripen and in which they're harvested. Uh, Thermidor is the new name for July because that is the hottest month. Thermidor, thermometer, you get the connection. So, um, and last of all, they try to remove Christianity at, from the central point that it has in French society. So they begin desecrating churches, destroying a religious artwork, and they also support a new religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being, which becomes the official French religion in this time period. And so, uh, with all these new reforms, it seemed like the uh, French Revolution could have stopped there. But there is still a lot of instability, and there are lots of economic problems. Uh, rising prices and shortages of certain important items. And uh, so, there's still some problems, but they probably could have been overcome if the king had not attempted to flee France to Austria. And uh, so basically the king had disguised himself and his family as um, just like normal upper middle class Frenchmen and had tried to escape during the night from Paris up into the Austrian Netherlands, uh, which were controlled by Austria. And uh, the king, Louis the Sixteenth, actually was married to a woman named Marie Antoinette, who was the daughter of the king of Austria. So if they had gotten to Austria, they might have been able to escape and then... Uh, who knows what would have happened. Perhaps the king of France would have led an army back to France to reclaim his throne. But so, um, anyway, the reason that this is so problematic that the king tries to escape is because the nation is still technically a monarchy, and the king is still technically in charge of the country. But soldiers arrest the king and take him back to Paris, and uh, this cartoon makes fun of the fact that the uh, King is more or less herded back to Paris like some kind of domesticated animal. And it seems like the king was pretty much ready to de betray the new French government. Um, but so the king is now under house arrest and Austria and Prussia, the absolutist monarchies to the east, warn France to not harm the royal family. France basically interprets this as a threat and feels insulted and they respond by declaring war on Austria. But the French army is incredibly um, 
incredibly disorganized because a lot of their officers have quit or have been fired. And so the initial battles go really terribly for France. Um, and Prussia soon, join, soon joins Austria uh, in the war against France. So uh, it starts to look as if Austria and Prussia are going to capture Paris and end the revolution and put Louis XVI back on the throne. Um, in response to all this instability and the threat uh, to the revolution, uh, the, uh, the French Revolution undergoes a period of radicalization. Uh, the first thing that happens is France becomes a republic. Uh, basically, the king is no longer in charge, and um, the new government, known as the National Convention, is elected by universal male suffrage. Any man in France gets to vote. Uh, second, the newly elected National Convention decides, as kind of its first measure, to execute the king for treason. And so in 17... Or in, uh, seven, 1893, the king is executed via guillotine, and this outrages basically every other nation in France. And they all ally against France and start fighting a war against France. So at this point, it's basically France against everybody else in Europe. This leads to the formation of the Committee of Public Safety. And this uh, small group of men is given more or less absolute control over the French government. And the reason they're given total control is so that they can take whatever measures are necessary to ensure the survival of France. The guy who runs this committee is uh, Maximilien Robespierre. And they begin taking really drastic steps in order to save the revolution. First of all, these guys declare total war when they issue something called the levé en masse. I think that means something as to as similar to mass conscription. And so basically what this decree entails is that every single young Frenchman is drafted. All married Frenchmen are expected to contribute to the war effort by helping to manufacture weapons and arms. And basically the entire population of France is mobilized in order to ensure that they win this war. Uh, and one other thing that the Committee of Public Safety does, and perhaps its most notorious um, action, is this period of time known as the Reign of Terror. It's more or less a year from 17, uh, 1793 to uh, 1794, in which the Committee of Public Safety executes basically anybody that they perceive as a threat to the revolution. And they execute almost 30,000 people, basically anybody that seems to be disloyal to the ideas of the French Revolution, or anybody that questions the uh, methods of the Committee of Public Safety. And this is often seen as one of the first instances of totalitarian government in uh, European history. Obviously, the Committee of Public Safety is not very popular because they start executing basically anybody. And it's really dangerous to be a member of the National Convention because you never know when the Committee of Public Safety is going to have you executed. Maybe you're not revolutionary enough, you don't seem loyal enough, so it's only it could be, only be a matter of time until you yourself are guillotined. And so, um, not surprisingly, the National Convention decides to arrest Maximilien Robespierre and the other leaders of the Committee of Public Safety, and these guys... Uh, in what seems like a fair move, are also executed via guillotine. And so this period is called the Thormidorian Reaction, when basically the reign of terror is brought to an end. And after this, a new system of government is put in place called the Directory, which lasts for four years. And the Directory is basically pretty unpopular and pretty unsuccessful. They keep fighting the war against France's many enemies, but they're not doing a great job. And it seems like if things keep going the way they're going, uh, the French Revolution might still fail. Um, so France is continually pushed back, but there is one bright spot in this whole story. And this happens to be a uh, general named Napoleon Bonaparte, who is a, an, a very bright young man um, who has worked his way up the ranks of the French army. And he has now, as general, begun winning major battles. And he is viewed as a hero by the people of France, and he becomes incredibly popular. And uh, he returns to Paris after a number of victories and basically begins plotting to take over the government and to make himself the leader of France. And you're going to learn more about this in our next video.
All right, so here are your goals once again. Hopefully you understood all of that stuff. Make sure you can answer these questions and we will discuss it in more detail in class tomorrow.